Thank you uh, very much. So I want to talk about the linguistic landscape of Middle and Late Bronze Age Western Anatolia. Uh, we all know that Anatolia is a bridge between Europe and the Near East, and that makes it a fascinating place uh, because it has been through time home to many population groups and languages that spread from the one area to the other. Uh, at the same time, Anatolia is a place that has a written history that started in about 2000 BCE. So for 4000 years, we can map what's going on in Anatolia linguistically. There's however one gap in our knowledge, that's the northwestern part, uh, because there are no written sources from this area until Roman times. But this is of course the region that is really the bottleneck uh, for the transition from Europe to the Near East. And that's why I find it an interesting region. So my question today is what was the language situation in this region in pre-Roman times? Uh, I will first look at 2nd millennium BCE sources and then move on to other uh, types of evidence that we can use. Uh, in the 2nd millennium BCE, uh, at, especially in the second half, uh, we all know, of course, that on the one hand we had the Hittite Emperor, Empire in central Anatolia. In the Greek uh, mainland and on the islands, there was the city of uh, the land of Achiawa. And in between, in western Anatolia, there was a bunch of states, some of which sometimes formed a unity which were called the Artsawa lands. And the region that we are interested in at that point in time was taken up by the lands of Wilusha and the land of Masha. And Wilusha is interesting because that's also uh, the place where the city of Troy was situated. So the whole area is also um, important for that reason. Um, if we look at the linguistic landscape in the second land BCE and we look at the sources that we have, there's not much to go on because all sources from Gatusha, for instance, we know that Hittite was spoken in central Palaic, Hattic, Hurrian, and some uh, Luwian texts we have found as well, but it's all really focused on the central part of Anatolia. That's the, the only view that we have if we take the text from Gatusha into account. If we take Linear B sources, they show that Greek was spoken in, uh, in the Aegean, on the islands and on the Greek mainland. Um, so that doesn't give much information on northwestern Anatolia either. And a third type of uh, scripts that we have is hieroglyphic inscriptions, which were probably uh, written down in Luwian. That already penetrates us much into western Anatolia, but still the northwest is not uh, uh, taken care of uh, with these sources. So still the northwest is sort of blank gap if we look at second millennium sources. So now the question is, what should we do? I want to uh, look... Uh, because the second millennium sources are not decisive at first millennium uh, sources. Well, then we have to take into account, of course, that the Bronze Age collapse around 1180 BC took place. So Troy falls, uh, the Hittite Empire falls as well. So the question is, uh, when we have these 150 years of dark age, um, can we really project back the linguistic situation from the first millennium BCE to the second millennium BCE? Uh, we have to be careful with that, but we'll see what we can do. So if we look at the first millennium BCE, uh, then Luwian is a language that is still spoken. It's the only language from the second millennium BCE that we have sources from in the first millennium BCE as well. Uh, but then it's confined really to the southeastern part of Anatolia. Uh, then there are many languages in alphabetic scripts, for instance Phrygian, uh, which takes up a large part of central Anatolia, and also northwest, so that's interesting. But we know Phrygian, it's closely related to Greek, and according to Herodotus, they came from the Balkans, where they were called Bruges, and that's quite likely to be true. Uh, almost everyone assumes that the Phrygians were newcomers into Anatolia after 1200 BCE, and therefore Phrygian probably was not spoken in Anatolia in the second millennium BCE. So Phrygian came in uh, at a certain point. So it's not an original second millennium BCE language in Anatolia. And then there's a bunch of languages also written in all kinds of different alphabetic scripts, all their own versions, Lydian, Carian, Lycian, Pisidian, and Sidetic. And the interesting thing is that these are all Anatolian languages, that is, linguistically Anatolian languages, in the sense that they are related to Hittite and Luwian. And that means that they were probably present in Anatolia in the second millennium BCE as well. So these are interesting. 
Then we have on the coast Aeolic and Ionic Attic Greek, uh, but these are very likely intruders as well in the sense that they came there after the Bronze Age collapse. So if we look at first millennium BCE material and what this could be the potentially oldest situation, then we're left with these languages, Luwian in the southeast and then Lydian, Carian, Lycian, Pisidian and Sididic in the south. And of these languages, Lydian is clearly the closest to the northwest. Um, so could this have been the language of Troy and uh, the surrounding areas, if you want to frame it like, uh, like that. Well, this was uh, proposed by Neumann. He says that it's quite probable that Lydian was spoken to the north of Lydian originally, both in Mysia and in the Troad. Uh, and it is confirmed by new finds from Daskilion. Daskilion is a city that was located over there. Uh, it used to be the capital of the satrapy of uh, Hellespontine Phrygia. It's being excavated by the University of Mula by Professor Kaan Iren, and they find pot chart with graffiti on it. And already a few years ago, I went on a field trip together with my professor Sasha Lubotsky, and we find many Greek graffiti uh, on these pot charts. Uh, also some Phrygian ones, but also Lydian ones, and these are interesting. Well, this specific fragment had already been published in the 1990s by uh, Bakker and Guzmani, where they said, well, uh, that they think that it's probably from Sardis, this fragment, the capital of classical Lydia. Um, so they say it could be just uh, coincidentally uh, that it's gotten there in Daskalayan, and they say that as long as this Lydian example from Daskalayan remains isolated, the find can also be explained due to trading connections. So they don't find this as telling for the linguistic situation in Daskalayan. However, Professor Irin says that the clay from this shard is clearly local from Daskalion, so the shard is from a pot that's locally uh, made. Uh, it can also be securely dated to 625 uh, to 575 uh, BC, which makes it a relatively old specimen of a Lydian language uh, object, um, which seems to be local from Daskalion, so that's interesting. And we also found two other Lydian graffiti, this is one. And this is one, they're very small, but we can tell that they're Lydian. So that confirms that at least some people spoke Lydian in the Skalion, which would mean that the Lydian area uh, can be uh, broadened more to the north. And this is interesting because this confirms an idea by uh, Professor Bakers, um, who says that in Homer, the Lydians are called Mayones, uh, with a stem Ma, which he wants to relate to the stem Ma that we find in this uh, land name, Masha. And if you remember, this is the second millennium BCE land, which is there to the north uh, of uh, classical Lydia. So according to Bakers, it could have been that in the second millennium, the Lydians actually lived in Masha. And he assumes even that they from there moved into classical Lydia at a certain point, which would be interesting because that could mean that in second millennium BCE the classical Lydian area actually was Luwian speaking for the largest part. So we have a, a potential little language movement going on here. Well, this also fits what Neumann says, both in Mysia and in the Troad, Lydian was spoken, so this could be then the language of northwestern Anatolia in the second millennium BCE. But we have also one other language in the neighborhood, it's actually Lemnian, uh, on the island of Lemnus, uh, across the sea from uh, the Troad. It's uh, attested in four inscriptions and several graffiti. Uh, this is the best known inscription, also the largest, largest one. And already very early on it was clear that this language is closely related to Etruscan. You could say Etruscan, that's really all over the place in uh, Italy, that's far away. How we can we have two very closely related languages so far apart from each other? Well, you can only explain this situation if you assume that either people that were speaking a sort of pre-version of Etruscan went on a boat and ended up in Lemnus and started writing there a few centuries later, which was then changed into the language of Lemnus, or the other possibility is that people from Lemnian, a pre-version, uh, spoke uh, that language and they went on a boat, ended up in Tuscany and started living there and their language developed into Etruscan. So these are two uh, uh, scenarios to explain this really bizarre situation to have these two closely related languages so far apart from each other. Well, this is already something that has been thought about by many people, and a lot of people assume that it was a west to east uh, uh, movement. And that's a traditional viewpoint of many Italian scholars, namely that Lemnian derives in the end from Tuscany. 
Uh, and also Oettinger, a German uh, uh, linguist, uh, says that that must be this, uh, the case, that Tuscany is the original area from this language that the language derives from it. And it's based on Raetic. Raetic is a sister language of Etruscan, spoken in the Alps. And Oettinger says it's a Rückzug. Uh, Gebiet, so this is not an area in which you would assume that people entered, but it should have been an original uh, area where language stays. Uh, well, but if you look at the location of the Raetic inscriptions, it's clear that they're located in the Etch style, which uh, still is, and back then also was the major route through the Alps. Nowadays, the big highway from Innsbruck to Italy uh, runs through this uh, valley. And I think that this is actually a place where you would want to be if you are a newcomer. This is where the trade happens from the north of the Alps to the south of the Alps. I think you can become very rich if you go live in this valley. So I don't think that this is a Rückzugsgebiet. Uh, so I don't think that that argument holds. If you look at the other option, the east-west option, saying that actually Lemnus or the area around Lemnus is the original place from where these languages originate and they moved into the area of Tuscany, uh, there are actually many arguments in favor of that view. Bacus in his article lists 24 of them. Uh, the most important ones to my mind are the fact that already in antiquity the Etruscans have always been regarded as very strange, had very strange habits, nothing compared to the surrounding uh, peoples. Herodotus says the Etruscans, eh, which he calls Tersenoi, that's the Greek version of the Etruscans, uh, that they came from Lydia, so that uh, clearly is a, a, a something that would support an east to west hypothesis. Um, but also the position of Etruscan between the surrounding uh, languages. Etruscan is non-Indo-European, but to its east it has Indo-European languages, to its west it has Indo-European languages. These languages are related to each other, and Etruscan is the one non-Indo-European language in between. I also like the argument of the river Umbro, which is clearly in the middle of Etruscan speaking area, but it's the same name as the Umbrians. So the Umbrians must have been named after the Umbro, so that means that it's quite likely that originally the area around the Umbro was Umbrian speaking, but Etruscans evaded into that area. Um, but also an archaeological argument, the Etruscan culture stems from what we call the proto villanova culture, which according to archaeologists is popping up, uh, auftauchend in Italy around 1200 BCE, with a break with preceding cultures. And if you look at the original, uh, the oldest sites that belong to proto villanova so this is a situation around 1150 BCE, it's very confined to specific areas. And if you then see the later expansions, you see from, from the coast they expand into inland, so to my mind, but I'm not a real archaeologist of course, this seems as if this culture originates from the sea. And then later on, this proto Villanova develops into the Villanova culture, which in the end becomes the Etruscan culture. Well, the date of this popping up of the proto Villanova culture around 1150 BCE, um, oh yeah, so this will mean that perhaps the speakers of pre Etruscan came from the sea around 1200 BCE. Well, this date matches the date that's given by Rix, uh, one of the linguistic experts on Etruscan, for the mother language of the Etruscan Raetic and Lemnian, uh, which he calls proto tersianic which he dates to have been spoken around 1250 to 1000 BCE, and then splitting up in these three uh, languages. It also matches the date uh, that has been given in a recent DNA paper on uh, the time in which the modern Tuscans uh, have undergone some admixture of Middle Eastern de uh, DNA. They date that uh, uh, event to around 1100 uh, to 600 BCE. So altogether it seems as if we could assume a sort of population movement from Lemnos or its surrounding areas to Italy in the end and also to Tuscany from 1200 to 900 BCE. Um, what about this Lemnus area? Well, Bacus also uh, points out that classical authors, so uh, uh, Greek and Roman authors, mention the presence of people that are called Tersiano Etruscans in northwestern Anatolia, and he plots them on a map. So the green spots are places where, according to classical authors, Tersianoi were living or had been living, for instance on Lemnos, but also on Lesbos, uh, in the Troad, also around Kusikos. And if you map these places together, then you get a sort of linguistic area where it could have been the, the case that Etruscan was spoken. And Bacus then uses this as an argument to say, look, the Etruscans did indeed come from Lydia, because you have this area where Etruscans and Lydians put, could have lived uh, together. I also think it's, would, 
be a very interesting indication that Troy could have been originally Etruscan speaking. And I like uh, that idea very much because an additional argument in favor of this view would then be that the myth of Aeneas could have had an historical basis. You could say, well, isn't that myth on, of Aeneas, yeah, the, the Trojan prince that goes on a boat and all around uh, the Mediterranean and ends up in Italy, is just totally made up on the basis of a wish to, uh, to have some kind of connection to the, to the epic uh, stories of Homer. Well, we have already in the 7th century BCE in a uh, Etruscan vase with a depiction of Aeneas on it. So that's very early. And in uh, the, uh, the Tales of Homer, Aeneas is only a minor figure. So I think that just a wish to belong to the Homer epics is not a good explanation of this situation. So my tentative reconstruction of the linguistic landscape of uh, Western Anatolia would be that we use the second millennium sources that we have. We add there the southern uh, uh, first millennium uh, languages, so pre-Carian, pre-Lycian, pre-Pacidian, pre sedetic they were spoken there. We can assume that pre-Lydian then would have been confined to the area of Masha, and I would say that there was a pre-Phrygian on the other side of the, uh, of the Sea of Marmara in Thrace, and I would say that this proto tursanic was spoken around Troy and in the northern Aegean. So this is my second millennium uh, reconstruction. Uh, then we have our Bronze Age collapse around 1180 BCE, the fall of the Hittite Empire. We get a power vacuum there. The Phrygians are very eager to uh, go into, uh, into Anatolia. So the Lydians, they have to move southwards. The Tarsanic people, they go on the boat and they, uh, they uh, go away. And then when later on the situation is more or less settled again, then we get this um, landscape with Phrygian having entered all the way into central Anatolia northwest. And the la only language from the Tarsanic family has, that has been remained is Lemnium. So that's my reconstruction. Thank you very much for your attention.